Hey there, welcome back. Glad to have you as always. Today we're going to be ripping into a GM 6L90 out of a 2013 CTSV. So unfortunately this thing suffered a catastrophic pump failure and no movement was the result. So this build is going to be a little bit different than most of everything I do in that the owner of the vehicle wishes to sell it as soon as it's back on the road. So he's having the primary shop R&R the engine. The engine is knocking. It's no good. So he's uh, going to be installing a good used replacement and he's also going to have me basically R&R the pump with a reman and then fix anything else in the transmission as needed so that it's viable. Uh, beyond that, uh, we're not going to be doing any and all the usual things we normally do with these things, which is replace all the electronics, including the Tecum, replace all the bushings, you know, paper and rubber. Pretty much, we are cutting this down to the bone, replacing only what is going to likely fail in the foreseeable near future. So, um, I told him that, you know, look, it's basically if you need something and I know it's bad, I'm not going to put it back in like that. Uh, he was fine with that, but beyond that, we are not doing anything else. In fact, I'm not even going to take the valve body apart. Uh, there was no drivability symptoms reported to the primary tech shop prior to the pump failing. So the assumption here we're going with is that everything else is largely fine in the transmission. Now we are going to take things apart, like such as the pump cover, you know, check the valving, particularly the pressure regulator valve to see if it's heavily worn. And if it is, we're either going to install a Sonics replacement valve or swap the pump cover with one that's not so hollowed out because when they suffer excessive, really, really severe wear, they destroy the casting as well. And you either have to ream it with an oversized valve or you simply replace it with one that isn't destroyed. So the latter option is going to be the more cost effective one. And, you know, those pump covers are relatively common. So the CTSVs have um, kind of a unique or organic to them output shaft flange. So let's kind of get it in front of you so you can see it. So we have six bolts to this coupler and then you have a main bolt here, 18 millimeters, holding it onto the output shaft. So this has to come off so that we can get the extension housing off and then, you know, we'll do that first and then start ripping through the rest of the unit. So like anything else, when you get a transmission in, you always want to check your spin on your shaft. So you want to make sure that it's spinning freely in both directions. It's going to spin much easier clockwise and in terms of direction engine rotation, then it will counterclockwise. Counterclockwise taking about four to five times the amount of effort to get it to spin. But what you're really looking for is any binding, grinding, galling, or unusual noises coming from inside the case or anything that feels weird when you're spinning these shafts. And ideally, you want to hold one of the shafts while you spin the other one. So if you hold the input shaft, spin the output shaft, the input shaft should not want to force its way against your hand while you're retaining it. If it does, that means something really, really, really bad has occurred inside this transmission and the input shaft and output shaft are somehow wedded or bonded together and that should never be the case when the transmission um, is not in park. Now if it's in park, obviously yeah, the output shaft's not going to move. All right, so now I'm spinning the input shaft and as you can see, the output shaft is not moving. I'm spinning it counterclockwise. When I spin it clockwise, it will move a little bit. And that's because there's, you know, uh, frictions and steels laden with fluid. And you have kind of like a, a very, very slight bond between the front of the case and the rear of the case. All the internals are meshed together or mated together. So it makes sense that it'll spin. But when you put your hand here and hold it and you spin the input shift clockwise, the output shift should not force its way against your hands. All right. So then check everything else, make sure that you have, um, you know, all your bolts, obviously. Make sure there's no damage to the case. You know, things like that you want to kind of identify right away. Um, if it has inspection covers, you can remove them. And then <clears throat> over here is going to be your ID tag. This is going to tell you the year in the application. Um, this looks like a 2012 unit. I'm not sure if this is original or not, but, um, you know, that's what, that's what we have. So. Uh, the 6L90s are a little bit longer than the 6L80s, 
So there's some things you need to be aware of when it comes to internal hard parts and interchange. The hubs, for example, are all longer in the 6090 than in the RNA 80 and they're not interchangeable. Um, the pumps, I believe in the very early days of these transmissions, 2006, 2007, uh, they were not interchangeable as far as the bodies were concerned, but then GM made a design change that made um, the bodies uh, such that you can actually install a 6L90 pump onto an 80 and vice versa. And I believe it has a part number. I'll flash the information on the screen. I don't have it memorized. But um, suffice to say, if you're working on a very early unit, you want to be on the lookout for that as well. I'm not going to take the linkage out here. Um, according to Primary Tech Shop, there's no leaks here, nor is there any leakage occurring here in the uh, parking pole housing. So there's two O-rings on this thing, and to get them out and to get the uh, housing out, you got to take out this very thick roll pin. There's a special tool for it. I have it if you watch my 6L80 video. I feature it there and it's kind of a pain in the ass. But uh, suffice to say because we're not even going to procure a paper and rubber kit unless we absolutely have to for this thing. I don't want to take it out. Alright, so this bolt takes an 18 millimeter socket. Use a half inch drive. <coughs> Impact if you can. I know 3 8 is never going to take this thing off. There it is. And because we have the slip yoke here, um, or not the slip yoke, the flange yoke, you want to make sure you inspect this area here. Um, these are readily available from various driveline shops, and uh, I believe the dealership also makes them available. So you want to make sure that the seal in the back of the case has not cut a groove that you can physically feel in the journal here, okay? Um, I'm going to closely inspect this once it's clean, but um, it doesn't feel like it has that kind of wear. It wasn't leaking. There's was no reports of any leaks with this thing, although I will say the fluid stinks. I mean, it definitely smells like something burnt. That could be, uh, it could be a consequence of the pump failing. Um, maybe there was some slippage just before it let go, or it could be the fact that this thing has a lot more impairment than, you know, what anyone could have known at the time it came off the road. I mean, it really stinks. So in here, you're going to have your splines. You want to check, make sure these splines are in good shape. Okay. Check the structure here itself. Um, make sure that there's no issues uh, with respect to cracking on the flange. Again, CTSV, the uh, Camaros, they have like a different, uh, you know, a different setup. So I'm going to just put this back behind here so it's out of the way. All right, now we'll go ahead and deal with the extension housing, 15 millimeters. So same, I would recommend using a half inch drive impact on these as well, as, as, along with the front pump bolts. So our mission here is to really inspect this thing, make sure there's no contaminants in the case. And then, like I mentioned earlier, just replace what has to be replaced, which based on the way this fluid stinks, that might be a lot more than what we initially thought. I am going to replace the uh, rear and front seal. I mean, the pump itself is going to be completely overhauled, machined, and all that good stuff. But I'm going to replace this rear seal as well just to be proactive. This thing has pry points, so. All right, so that's kind of what it looks like. And then you have an O-ring here. Check it. I have almost no dexterity, so... I think I have a few of these O-rings extra, so this one turns out to me no good. Then I can just put a new one on there, but it appears to be fine. Um, normally, this stuff, kind of stuff will go in the trash, but... I'm just going to stick it aside for now.
Okay, so we're still in park. I don't know why I'm trying to turn the output shaft. Okay, our square cut seal, same thing. This feels fine to me, but I'm going to like that. We'll replace that as well. There's a bushing in here. Um, Got to inspect this bushing. The bushing itself actually looks okay. Let me see if I can get this a little closer. I'm going to wipe it down a little bit. So that's the bushing. All right, to the back of the bench with it. All right, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip the whole case over. I'm not gonna take the front pump bolts out just yet. And first thing I actually wanna do is remove this little, I don't know what the hell you wanna call it, it's not a dipstick. A checking port and you can check your fluid levels. Put that there. And these are the fairly fairly heavy, fairly bulky transmissions, so you do want to use some caution. Um, you want to make sure your bench is sturdy, it's not you know too wobbly or unstable or whatever. But other than that, it's just like any other, I suppose. All right, these are going to be tens. But given this is a 2013, it will not have a cooler bypass valve. At least it shouldn't. But if you have one that does, I would recommend either flipping the pill or installing a a superior tech delete kit that will ensure you have 100% contiguous fluid flow through the system as opposed to having a thermostat element that's you know retaining fluid preventing it from flowing until that thermostat element opens all the way for like 99% of climates in the world you do not do that in my humble opinion I mean, I know they engineered these transmissions to run a little bit hotter. Deck 6 is specifically designed to, uh, you know, withstand heat much more efficiently and effectively than legacy Dex Merc. But at the same token, heat is arguably the number one killer of transmissions. So if you can mitigate the risk. All right, I'm going to pry this away. Let's see what this looks like. Yeah, we have some some nasty fluid. I'm guessing it hasn't been changed in like forever. This gasket is reusable, so I'll have to clean this off and then check it. For now, it'll go into the trough and drain. All right, you have your filter. So with these 6L 80s, 90s, you want to double check, make sure that this filter is not cracked on the neck. If you have like, you know, all of a sudden severe slipping, delayed engagements, flare shifting, things of that nature, um, it is possible that, that filter is cracked and fluid is not making it into the pump like it should. All right. So now we'll go ahead and start taking the uh, valve body complex off. First thing you want to do is just remove that um, D10 roller bolt. So it's going to be eight millimeter. So you're going to have couple of different socket sizes you need to deal with. So you're going to have 8mm, uh, 10mm, and then you're also going to have what's called um, an inverted Torx 12. Uh, Snap-on 10 EPL socket is what you want to use. Um, I sometimes refer to these particular fasteners as starfish fasteners. So, um, you know, you would need this socket to have on there. Um, if you don't have that socket, you'll need to acquire it.
Okay, all of the pan bolts in the valve body, uh, half bolts, in other words, valve body assembly, uh, tecum to valve body, as well as valve body assembly to case bolts, they all get the same amount of torque, and that's uh, 71 inch pounds. All right, so the first thing you want to do is just lift up on your gate latch for your um, pass-through connector. That'll allow you to free the assembly from the case once the bolts are removed. So this is the internal mode switch. This is your transmission electric hydraulic control module, aka TECM. And this part number right here, the 24261870, um, this is important if you're doing swaps because <clears throat> to make it like plug and play, you're going to need to acquire a TECM that has the same part number if you're just looking to swap transmissions or you're gonna have to transfer your TECM over to the replacement. Okay, I have several videos on you know diagnosing and troubleshooting these transmissions, uh, 680 90s. Procedurally, in that regard, they're all the same. So like I said, we're not actually going to take this valve body apart. Unless, unless I deem it's necessary, unless there's um, you know, something we find in here that tells me that, yeah, it's actually prudent to do so. So I want to be real careful with it. Okay, valve body underwent several engineering changes over the course of its life cycle, or this transmission's life cycle, I should say. So, um, you know, whenever you're going back with it and you need to mix and match parts, you need to make sure that you're pairing and mating the appropriate lower valve body to the uh, corresponding upper valve body. Same with the spacer plates, they underwent changes. Uh, there was a change and I want to say, 2007 or 2008, another one in 2010, and another one in 2014 when they added an eighth check ball to the assembly. All right, now what I want to do is fire up the air compressor so that we can perform a case air check. I want to see um, how healthy or not all of these apply circuits are. So you have your seals here, I'll just leave them in for now. And um, then you have your front clutch circuitry up here along with your compensator feed. So we'll do that real quick. All right, so what I've done is labeled the circuits here on the pump. So we have our one, two, three, four clutch, our three, five R clutch, our four, five, six clutch, and then our compensator feed system. So we're gonna air test all those. We also have the boost and PR system labeled. Uh, so when I get this pump out, I'm actually going to take the boost and the pressure regulator valve out of the pump cover so that we can see if it's excessively worn or not. All right, so then you have 2.6 and low reverse here and here, respectively. So clutch to clutch transmission, um, you have a series of clutch packs that apply and then release all in kind of a sequence to give you your different gears. So your 1, 2, 3, 4 clutch is on in well, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th gear. 3.5R is on in 3rd, 5th, and reverse, respectively. 456, well, so on in 456. Same with 26, so on in second and sixth gear. And then, of course, low reverse is on in reverse and manual mode. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm putting air in. I'm going to put air in, then I'm going to release the trigger, but not take the nozzle away for maybe a second or two. And I want to see if air stays trapped in the circuit. Here's going to be your 1, 2, 3, 4 clutch. Sorry about that. Using uh, between 85 and 100 PSI. Okay, there's so much air trapped, it's actually forcing its way out. So this seems healthy to me. All right, now 3.5R. The 3.5R drums in these transmissions are notorious for leaking, where the uh, dr the clutch baskets welded to the stator of the drum at the base of it. So we're going to test that once we get this drum out, but for now, let's air check it here. So here is your 3.5R clutch. OK, 
Okay, four, five, six. Sorry, I have it mislabeled. This is your cooler line out. All right, so air seems to be staying trapped into the circuit. And, um, you know, I mean, that's a good sign because like I said, we're not planning on even installing a full paper rubber kit in this thing. Everything is on an as needed basis when it comes to replacement. All right, now we'll go ahead and we'll do the two six. Okay, low reverse. Okay, both sound good. Now I'm gonna do the compensator feed. So it's the compensator feed that when you test it, you really wanna um, see and or hear air staying trapped into the compensator feed circuit while you have your nozzle hard and fast to the pump. Okay, if, if it's not retaining any kind of air, then that would tell me that we have worn sealing rings or worn lip seals or some other sort of impairment that is going to otherwise play havoc with the timing of applying release of all your clutch packs. Because, you know, unlike a traditional transmission where you have, you know, accumulators and you have, um, you know, more or less a discrete circuit where the accumulator circuits built into that apply circuit, this is not the case with these transmissions. They're a lot more sophisticated and you can't really do that with these because there's, um, you know, you'd have a huge transmission given the amount of gears. I mean, six, eight, ten speeds, it adds up. So, um, they went to a compensator feed type system to replace that legacy design and engineering model where you have separate accumulators which are designed to soften or slow down shifts so that they don't bang shift. Okay, compensator feed system does the same thing. It also prevents centrifugal apply. This is kind of weak, actually. Hmm. Again, 15 millimeters on all these pump the case bolts. Before we do that, we need to take off our torque converter clutch O-ring seal. Not too concerned about ripping that because I have plenty of these. And that one was kind of hardened, to be honest. I just want to get the pump off of the deck surface. Which I should have done prior to start removing bolts, but you know, that would have made too much sense. And if it makes too much sense, I ain't gonna do it. Just pull the pump free. Hopefully I wasn't like majorly in the way there. All right. Reposition the camera once again and we're gonna just take the pump apart back. Actually, let's do that in a little bit. came out with 3-5R drum. It's not supposed to be up like this. There we go. All right, here's our 456 hub. As you can see, it's all some heat. Possibly due to uh, pump failure, possibly due to something else. Note your bearing locations. 
Okay, there's a damper in there that comes out. We'll deal with that in a little bit. It's gonna be your one, two, three, four clutch hub. Okay, like I said earlier, make sure you're not mixing and matching 6L80 and 90 hubs because they are of different lengths. All right, well, like I said, we'll look at these in a little bit. For now, I just want to get the case empty. So we have our um, giant snap ring in here. Here's one of the ends. The other one is kind of submerged in fluid. So in my humble opinion, the only proper way to deal with these is via the giant snap ring pliers. Now I got a little bit better visibility. And so do you. Here we go. I was missing the eye loop. That was the problem. Again, when it made too much sense to drain the fluid first. All right, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tap on this with hammer and a screwdriver. All right, there we go. I just need to be a little bit firmer, a little bit more aggressive than I was being, so. All right, so the beveled side faces out or faces you. And then you're gonna have two keyways holding or locating the center support into the case. And the center support does have a snug fit. So, sometimes you gotta do what I just did. If it, you know, if it uh, kind of gets stuck on there. So, all right. Now we have our planet and sun gears. So the sun gears and the planet are kind of one assembly. As is the, uh, you know, it's kind of all one deal with the ring gear, the output shaft, so it's very heavy. In fact, I'm going to get a special tool and thread it in there, and that'll help me take it out safely. So I'll flash the thread pitch. Actually, it's written right here, M12175. Um, there's a adapter case, makes a special tool as well. And basically the uh, principle is you just thread it into the uh, base right at the bottom of the uh, interior of the output shaft. And this is how you lower it into the case when the transmission is on the fixture. All right, it's time to change the battery out. All right, battery in. So we're gonna have a rear case bearing. Okay, it's gonna be very back of the case. 
All right, case is now empty, so I'm just gonna let it drain. Got that stubborn friggin' uh, case snap ring. I get these bearings over here. All right, we'll start with the planetary assembly. So this being a uh, 2013, it should have the uni gear design. In other words, um, instead of having two separate ring gears for each um, series of planetaries in the uh, whole assembly here, it has one unified ring gear housing. And then of course you have your independent sun gears and their respective bearings. And then you have your needle bearing assembly here. So you just want to check this, make sure it's not making an unusual amount of noise, that the rollers aren't missing or damaged, the structure itself, um, there's special bushing or bearing drivers you can use to install these and you can just pull it out with a slide hammer and like a hook type attachment and that, you know, allows it to come right out. Alright, so you have your snap ring here. Let's see if I could find a suitable screwdriver. Just trying to grab this thing so that it's I'm not going to slip out of my hands. Alright. Okay, this is not a uni gear design. Hmm. So the side faces front. See indexing marks here, and then the side faces rear. So either they did not install a uni gear into all of these transmissions, or it was maybe a 6L80 thing, and then the 6L90 um, was migrated over later. I don't know, to be perfectly honest. I'll, I'll see if I could, uh, look it up or contact ATRA or ATSG and um, figure it out and then annotate the video once I have the info. But here's your bearing, check it. Make sure it's good. I'm not going to take out the other ring gear. Very interesting. So, I'm just going to put this back in here like this for now. I know that the planet obviously has to be in there before you do this. So check your splines here, check your lugs for your parking gear, check this journal, make sure it's not damaged in any way, shape or form. There is a Teflon bushing in the rear of the case that helps kind of reduce the uh, wear there and you know ease it up on the contact. If I could get it to where you could see it, it would be helpful. There it is. Hopefully you sold that. Okay, for planet, just check all your teeth. Make sure the plant's not making any kind of uh, unusual noise, like uh, you know, sound like sand is in the in the in the pinions or um, in the captured bearings. If you're not going to take the needle bearing assembly out, then you're not going to be able to remove the sun gears. So just check them. You know, spin the uh, sun gears individually to make sure that there's nothing unusual going on, no odd sounds. Everything should spin nice and smooth. Okay, I will uh, clean this off. When it comes to planets, and this is going to be true of all of them, uh, all I do is just thoroughly wipe them down and then soak them in transmission fluid, you know, fresh transmission fluid. Uh, you can take a little bit of brake cleaner on a rag, like, you know, for example, if you want to just remove some of the stinky smell, just, you know, and then wipe it down. Do not spray brake cleaner into the pinions and zip it dry with shop air. Um, I say that in numerous teardown videos. I'll say it here. And that's just simply because you take a, a chance on ruining <clears throat> the assembly that way. You, you destroy the little needle bearings in each of these pinions. 
So when you do that, then that's no good. The bearings are shot and the whole thing has to be either rebuilt or replaced. All right, so I am not going to be taking out any of the applied pistons unless I deem them bad. You know, so we're gonna do what we can to air check before we uh, pull anything apart. So I will reverse, two six. I'll have to measure these clearances off camera and see if we need to put new steels or new frictions just because we're outside of clearance specification. Um, you know, we're, we have too much of it. Clutch, clutch transmissions are very, very sensitive to clearance. So if you're out of spec, you might a little bit, you will likely have drivability issues. If you're too tight, you'll have tie-ups. If you're too loose, you'll have flares. I mean, the system will adapt to a certain extent, but it's not going to adapt, you know, to an infinite extent. So there's only so much wiggle room you have. All right, let's take a gander at these frictions and steels, and then we'll flip it over and look at the uh, low reverse. So note the two ends are sharp and pointy. Be careful. I cut my finger a few times on them. So we have six and six. And in these, the top um, backing plate is nearly the same dimension in terms of thickness as the flat steels. So you have your, your cushion plate. And then you have your first flat steel. And you can always tell by the wear pattern what the bottom steel is. So the 2.6 clutch in most of these transmissions, frankly, is um, it's rare that it's bad. At least in my experience. I mean, others may have differing, um, you know, differing experiences with them. You know, if you've done a ton of these transmissions, then maybe your perspective is going to be different. But um, the ones that I've done, you know, again, not all, not all a huge amount by any stretch, but. Um, I very rarely see this clutch bad. And here I'm talking about the entire transmission family. For those of you that don't know, <clears throat> these six speeds from GM, Ford, and Dodge are all based on the ZF6 HP26, which these respective OEMs manufactured under license from ZF to, uh, you know, install into various passenger car, truck, and SUV applications. So. Um, the OEMs over here reasoned it was a lot more cost effective and, you know, they were able to streamline production a lot more effectively by kind of adopting a pre-existing design as opposed to reinventing the wheel and developing six speeds from scratch. And they did the same thing with the eight speeds, but the ten speeds are uh, a little different in that GM and Ford developed their ten speed transmissions together independent of ZF. I've never done an 8-speed or a 10-speed as a, at the time of this filming, so I couldn't really tell you. Um, yeah, I couldn't really tell you anything about them beyond <clears throat> what little research I've done, what little information I'm aware of. All right. All right. So here is going to be your low reverse clutch pack as well as your rear sprag assembly. It freewheels counterclockwise and locks clockwise. And it freewheels counterclockwise because the clutch basket that it's in is facing rearward. If this low reverse clutch was facing forward, it would freewheel clockwise. And the reason for that is it always will hold against engine rotation. So if this freewheels in both directions, then you're not going to have any movement in, you know, um, any, uh, any forward range position. All right. All 
All right, there is a bobbin piston under there. There is a snap ring securing the uh, Sprague assembly to the uh, center support. And you notice there's a blind spline. So um, I have other videos if you want to see what that looks like and how this should go back in orientation wise and how you locate it properly, you can check those out. But basically you spline this on to the center support um, female splines um, in such an orientation that the blind splines kind of align. Hey, that seems fine. <laughs> I mean, you can't really check it by hand. Um, a bad sprag will more than likely hold, you know, if you're trying to force it to roll over by hand. All right, so you got your cushion plate here. And it looks like we got another six and six, so three and three. I've never seen a CPSV 6L90 before. That's why I'm not certain, you know, I'm counting the clutches with you. So want to see if there's kind of any difference between them and other um, 6L80, 6L90s. So these look perfectly fine to me. All right, so you see the wear pattern here going all the way around. You can tell that that was made by the piston. So that side faced down into the drum. So like I said, this is basically a patch job. And it's not something I normally like to do, but at the same token, um, as long as you and the customer all, you know, have a full understanding of what's being done and you align on the plan and everybody's on the same page about what to expect then you know it is what it is um, these frictions and steels are in perfectly fine condition I have no concerns that this transmission will work for the foreseeable future um, you know to a reasonable extent and that's really the main thing reasonable extent you know using a reasonable person standard in this case is it going to fail within the first 5,000, 10,000 miles? As long as um, everything else is equal, my guess, um, or I should say my very strong suspicion would be no, it would be perfectly fine. Just doing some bench tidying here, don't mind me. All right, hub. We'll have a look see at the hubs, specifically the splines and the lugs. You want to make sure that the lugs don't have a whole bunch of uh, teeth chatter type wear, where they're heavily scored. Like you can see it here on the sides of each of these lugs. That's normal. If you see it here on the face, that's probably um, cause for concern to the extent that you'd want to replace uh, the hub if you saw that. Um, for high performance, a trick is to TIG weld these hubs and shafts together down here. Just reinforce the uh, pre-existing welds. Um, I've seen that done before. I don't weld, so it's not something I would physically do myself, but my machinist would do it. So, again, same deal. You're checking for any signs of cracking, fracturing, etc. Okay, I'm not going to really inspect these right now. If they're disgusting. I'm going to clean them off. The case will be washed. So your 456 hub, this can separate from the shaft, you know, these two things here can separate. And uh, when that happens, you use all four, five, and six. I mean, you have no overdrive, basically. Come on, Baron. Okay, so this inner portion of the bearing faces this way. All right, so there's a damper in here. <clears throat> now, Sonics makes a billet 456 clutch hub assembly, shaft and hub, the whole deal. Um, you know, obviously hard and heat treated splines. And uh, I like theirs because you can run the factory damper. Uh, this damper plays a role in, you know, overall um, 
shift feel management, if you will. And so I like to have it in there, all other things equal regardless of the application. All right, so check this bearing. So make sure the damper is not cracked. Make sure material is not kind of falling off of it. And then you want to really scrutinize this area in here. Um, you really can't see much in here, but it's in here where this will crack and separate from the hub. This is the shaft, this is the hub. And you want to make sure that that's not going to happen based on what you see. Uh, there is some heat. You can clearly see it got hot. And then this is through and through to the pinhole feed here. If you're testing the compensator feed system through the pump when everything, all the sub-assemblies are pre-assembled, you would take a finger and put it here so that you can air check that compensator feed system without air escaping through this uh, blowhole. Actually, I'm going to leave that apart because I'm going to clean these. All right. Turbine shaft and front planetary carrier group. So make sure that when you put your planet back in, it's, you know, in this orientation with splines facing you. If you don't do that, then the splines um, on the 3.5R clutch drum will have nothing to grab onto and you will have no movement in any gear or range position. So alternatively, if the sun gear fractures or the planet gets destroyed, the same symptom will present. On bearing. Okay, have your bearing. Check it. And then you're going to have the thrust washer that goes here on the planet. Check for vertical play, check for side play, check condition of the teeth, the structure. I mean, all this is no different than how you would inspect any other planet. Check these splines, make sure they're good. Make sure that uh, none of the splines are missing, no you know, partial or total strippage, if you will. And yes, I am starting to make up words, but I think you get the meaning. Same with the sun gear. The sun gear is orientation agnostic. You can put it in this way, or you can flip it up and down and put it in that way. It doesn't matter. All right, now we're going to air check the 456. This clutch is very vulnerable. But like I said, no drivability symptoms reported with this unit. Okay, so notice I'm plugging my, uh, this is a dual feed, so I'm plugging the feed on this side while I'm putting air here. Okay, this is compensator feed, this is four, five, six. All right, that is very, very nice. See if we could do it where you can actually see the uh, frictions apply. Frictions and steels, clutch pack. Okay, very nice. So this clutch should be healthy. Right? Okay, now the front three drums, or I should say front three clutch packs, all have selective snap rings. So this clutch pack, the, three, the 456, and then the two clutch packs in, I know you can't see it, but in the 35R drum, um, the 1234 and the 35R, they all use selective snap rings. There's different thicknesses that you can acquire to dial in your clutch clearances and get them where they need to be. Okay, like I said, we're not going to take that apart if this looks good, although I'm looking at it and we see some heat.
so I'm gonna recommend that he change out these frictions. Let's take a look at the steels. So we see some slip marks. So I think he's gonna need frictions and steels. I mean, you can probably clean these up. The Sonics High Performance um, 456 Piston Kit will allow you to add one additional friction steel into this clutch. So it looks like just this one side of this one clutch is not burnt. And I guess that side too. So yeah, um, he's going to need a 456. So we were two for two until we got here. But I am not comfortable putting these back in like that. They look like shit. All right, get this thing over here and out of my way. So that's the source of some of this nasty ass fluid. Let's see what the clutch packs look like. But before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and insert my tool here. It's an air checking tool and you've probably seen it before. I have a few videos where I'm using it. Um, and uh, it is intended to check both the one, two, three, four, three, five R clutch packs, as well as the compensator feed circuitry in this drum. And it's got some, I think probably a piece of paper towel or some other debris. All right, let me go get that tool. All right. I'm going to pour a little bit of fluid here and I'm looking for bubbles all around the weld that you see. This is the weld seam and so I'm going to look for fluid all around this weld. So bubbles coming out of the fluid. Um, I have a separate video on just testing these drums and talking about all the problems and symptoms you'll have if your drum is leaking like most of these do. So we'll see if this one is just another statistic or if it bucks the trend. So we'll go one, two, three, four, which that's not gonna test this. The three, five R will test this. I'm just curious to see if there's any issues with the one, two, three, four clutch. All right, that's weird. 3, 5, R. Okay. Robust apply on the 3, 5, R and I don't see any bubbles. Right, let me change the battery out once again and then we'll continue. No leaks here at the base weld, so this definitely bucks the trend, which is nice to see. All right, let's take a gander at these frictions and steels. Start with the 3.5R clutch, and then we'll work our way to the 1, 2, 3, 4. Clearance seems a little high. To measure all these clearances as they are, but Okay, so here's our cushion plate. Here's our bottom steel. It's 
friction. See a little bit of heat. See where the clutch um, is not discolored at the very perimeter, you know, right on the edge, maybe the you know, last 20% of it, and then everything else inboard has a little bit of heat to it. Got a little bit of signs of slippage. Nothing super concerning. I mean, if you compare the condition of these steels with those in the 456, um, slip marks like this you can certainly kind of prep out, if you will. You, know, you can get rid of most of that. Um, you want to check to make sure that the steels are in fact flat, but when you see slippage just like this, it's usually not um, indicative of a warped steel. This one's got a little bit more slippage. Okay. Um, it's got a little bit more slippage, so I have plenty of good used steels that I can sell to him relatively cheaply, a lot cheaper than what he would have to pay over the counter. Um, same here, you have slip marks. This is, I don't want to say this is normal, but unfortunately it is normal. It's not supposed to be that way, obviously, but um, it's a CTSV, it's a performance car, it's got a, you know, 6.2 very powerful engine. And my guess is that the uh, owner drives it as such. I mean, you know, why have a car if you're not going to enjoy it? You know, a car like that. All right, so that's your 35R clutch. So here's your 35R apply ring. Sonix makes a high performance version of this that will allow you to squeeze an additional friction and steel. So I'm going to see if he's wanting to do that. My guess is no, simply because of his plans with the vehicle. Um, the other thing that I want to make sure I point out before we move any further here is the blind spline or you know unified lug on these things. Let's see if I can find it. And this one doesn't have one. Yeah, right here. So you notice this lug here, right here, you see how that lug, or that gap rather, is um, displaced relative to all of the others. So you want your two ends, your snap ring, right here on either side. All right, and then same with this lug. This lug is completely uninterrupted, so that's where we're going to put the uh, snap ring for the one, two, three, four clutch when we go back with it. And then of course you have the word up cast or stamped into the apply plate. These are all selected, like I mentioned. Different thicknesses are available. clumsy today. Visually that doesn't look bad. Okay, so here's our cushion plate. We got our bottom steel. Friction. That friction looks fine. Steel. This friction looks for the most part okay. Yeah, a little discoloration here that might actually be staining from fluid. I don't see any slip marks. I mean, this clutch is a working clutch. It comes off in fifth and sixth gear, but it's usually not damaged. Not like the 35R and the 456. 456 um, takes the brunt of punishment when it comes to heat, and the 35R is very close behind when the drum leaks. This drum is not leaking, so that's good news. All right. Um, this clutch pack looks fine to put back in. So, I know what you're probably thinking, like this is completely ghetto and 
Like I would never do a build like this, but and I don't blame you for thinking that. And I, it's the first time I'm doing this with one of these units. But again, it's all about setting expectations up front. You know, customers trading off cost for savings and he's engaged in a risk reward proposition. And so, you know, it's understood he wants to sell it and he wants to, to move on, but you know, you just gotta be careful. So here's our blind spline. Now when you go to put these back, you wanna make sure all these tabs, including those on the cushion plate, all line. Otherwise you'll never get the 3.5R ply ring back in. So they have to line up and be in sync with each other perfectly. This drum is really, really, really um, tighter. I just don't know what the hell I'm doing. But these steels are fitting in there very snug. They're not bound up or anything. I mean, they're moving normally, but they're just in there snug. I actually character characterize it as a perfect machine fit. Started this thing a hair too far to the right. Damn it. And the trash truck is coming back round, so we get to pause and wait for it to pass us by. Alright. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring the pump over. To air check the forward clutch through the pump. And, you know, maybe it's been a long day, I don't know, but it just occurred to me that the reason why the 1, 2, 3, 4 clutch was applying all goofy was because it was upside down. And when you have it upside down like this, you're not gonna, you're not gonna have kind of a, a, a release, if you will, of the clutch because gravity is gonna be preventing you from, from seeing that. So, All right, we only want to put air in the one, two, three, four, not the three, five bar. Okay, seems to be good. There you go. That's how it should be. Okay. I'm going to stick the 3.5R apply ring back in there. And our 3.5R clutch drum. Just want to get eyes on that one offset spline. I think I'm going to have him replace this clutch pack anyway. I mean, it looks, it looks a little distressed. To me. So he needs four, five, six, and three, five R frictions and seals. That's that's what I'm comfortable with. But we will get a better sense of the apply in the three, five R by doing it this way before we take the pump apart. All right, three, five, R. And the 
boatload of air coming out of this nozzle. Okay, when I'm gonna put air in my one, two, three, four, I wanna feel if I have air coming out of this three, five R. I have nothing coming out of here. So we'll put a towel. You can see the towel get blown back. You know you have a cross leak. All right, I'm charging that circuit. Now I'm releasing. And no leakage. So it's in good shape. All right, off with this drum. Frictions and at least for the 35R are going to come out again. So now we have our pump. So for these transmissions, you're going to need some sort of alignment tool as a means to ensure the pump cover and the body are perfectly aligned. So for these transmissions, that means J46664, 46664, or an aftermarket equivalent. And I don't know who makes the aftermarket equivalents, maybe adapt a case, but either way, the tool's not cheap. And you can, you can try to use a hose clamp if you want. Um, I, I guess it's up to you where your tolerance for risk is, but these have to be absolutely perfect when it comes to this mating. I mean, that's true of all these pumps, but these especially. And um, if you're off by just a little bit, then that's gonna be an issue. So you'll notice here you have a stator to stator support gasket, okay? GM tells you not to remove the stator and Therefore, there's no need to replace this. However, if you have drivability symptoms and <clears throat> you know, you, during the course of the investigation, uh, you re, you know, it, it's revealed that this, um, I guess everything else has been ruled out as far as ceiling rings and the turbine shaft and, and the stator here. Um, it's possible that you could have a gasket that's blown and you'll want to replace it. We're not going to touch it in this transmission, but I typically, um, push this stator out, you know, basically by pressing it out, and replace this gasket. They come in the aftermarket kits, but GM's kit does not have it. So eight millimeter. And these, all these bolts are tightened down in a specific sequence. And I'm not paying any attention to that now, simply because this whole thing, both halves are getting machined. The only thing I'm doing is removing the perimeter bolts and working my way in. That's that's really it. Okay, so there was two designs for these stators. You had your early design that had traditional ceiling rings, and then you have this late design that uses the locking style ceiling rings and underneath these ceiling rings there are what we call support o-rings so one of the pattern failures that was commonly reported and where warranty claims were paid out a lot on were the um, cross leakage that i just spoke about between the one two three four <clears throat> excuse me and three five r clutch drums most of that was owing due to the poor design of those ceiling rings they did not seal adequately in many cases so just wanted to get those last couple bolts so what you would do in these situations is if you're working on one of those early designs I think it's 2000 up through 2009 uh, and you have a first design stator stator support you just simply retro a second design stator stator support assembly onto that first design body these stators never changed, or excuse me, the stator supports themselves never changed. Um, the only thing that changed was the ceiling ring design.
All right, these bolts are all the same. And that got mangled, absolutely mangled. So, I mean, this whole casting is no good. I mean, we're gonna take the uh, pressure regulator and boost valve out anyway, but I mean, that thing is mangled. So, if you were so inclined, you can install Transgo's unbreakable pump ring kit. Um, that wouldn't have helped you here. I don't know, this thing just suffers some sort of catastrophic failure, but needless to say, oops, it will be getting an entirely new pump assembly. Chunks. So everything broke apart, nothing can be salvaged. So these are all powdered metal and generally speaking, they're actually very resilient. All these pumps are. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the hell happened here, but This is your pivot pin and spring. It's you know more or less one piece. Yeah, that's that's chunks. All right, here's our pump o ring. Let's see if we can get this facing you. This could be milled out. I mean, it looks horrific, but that's, this is repairable. And this is the main thing uh, as far as criticality when it comes to pump halves. The pump body bell housing to me is more important because it's costlier to replace. So this half, these are everywhere. Second design is much more prevalent than the first design. So you would, install a second design you know into your 6L80 and 90 regardless all right let's get this crap out of the way so here is our boost and our PR valve a very common problem with these transmissions, the 80s and the 90s, is excessive wear, like severely excessive wear in the pressure regulator valve itself. All right, so all I'm doing here to get this roll pin out is pushing on the boost valve, and then I'm just wrapping it on the bench. Push in, come out. There's a little boost. PR and bumper spring. So you got two springs. Come on. Don't be shy. I'm gonna bite. All right, this thing has some stage fright. Let's find out why. Maybe it has something to hide. It's trying to conceal something on us. All right. This is actually in pretty good shape. It's this land right here that suffers. This land can suffer too, but I don't see that here. A little bit of wear there. But given the divot here, there's no way in hell that sound would be. Well, I could be wrong, I guess. I mean, my machinist is the expert here, but I don't believe it can be saved. It's a little boost.
All right, normally you would check your splines here, like, you know, if you didn't already do so, check journals, check um, once you take off the ceiling rings and everything, check there. Um, you have this spacer here. This spacer, I should have mentioned this at the outset, I forgot, I'll annotate the video, but <clears throat> end play is not adjustable officially from, uh, you know, from the factory, front end play that is. These are regulated to be, I think, 50 thousandths of an inch. And so when you machine your pump halves, you're going to want to purchase Sonics's oversized, um, oversized thrust washer because you're going to otherwise have an additional 20 thousandths of an inch in terms of end play because you're reducing the overall height of the pump by machining it. All right, so you have these tabs and they have little retention. Um, you know, the ends are designed to click into the stator. So you're gonna have to monkey with it to get it off. All right, so boost and PR is out. You have converter apply, converter limit. I'm not gonna mess with them for now. So let me back the camera out and then we'll just kind of summarize our findings and be done. Okay, so all in all, uh, this transmission wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be based on how bad the fluid stunk. Um, I'm not sure if this fluid was ever changed. I'm guessing it wasn't, but I could be wrong. Um, it just could be simply the, you know, the fluid, um, you know, in, in a high performance application just gets dirtier faster. Um, we saw stress in the 456 clutch, both frictions and steels. Um, show a lot of signs of overheating, so we're going to replace that clutch pack in its entirety. Uh, the apply piston and balance piston are fine. I mean, you saw the air check, there was literally no leakage. Um, <clears throat> the uh, 35R is also a little stressed. I'm going to see what I can do about uh, getting a clutch pack in there. So he's going to be into it for two clutch packs. Um, Bushings, you want to check. I forgot to mention that again, you know, kind of flying by the seat of my pants here. Check the bushings. You know, we're going to install new bushings in whatever stator I end up with. Here, you know, um, and I'm going to put a new uh, pump body bushing and seal in the uh, bell housing slash pump, bo uh, pump body. The 2.6 and low reverse clutches are fine. No issues there. And the one, two, three, four clutch also appears to be perfectly fine. So anyway, um, we're not going to do anything with the valve body. Um, the case will be cleaned out. I'll check that over. But basically, it's going to be a repair. It's going to have a brand new pump and new clutches and steels in the 456 and the 35R. And um, that's probably it. Uh, you know, that torque converter clutch o-ring has to be replaced. I broke it. Um, I have, like I said, those and a pump o-ring. I'll put a new one on there too. Um, and a new filter. We're going to put a new filter on it. All right. Well, hope that was entertaining and or educational for you. Thanks so much for watching as always. Um, glad to have you on the channel. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, go ahead and leave them below. If you want to see anything else related to these transmissions, go ahead and put it there and I will do my best to prioritize making a video when I have the opportunity to do so. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your day or evening and look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thanks again.